Okay. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to talk today about security advisory programs, and we're going to talk about uh, you know security advisory programs. We're talking about communicating vulnerabilities that are in uh, your software to your customers. Um, I think this is really important, um, especially as we see more more focus, more interest on securing the software supply chain, um, and more you know industry pressure on creating transparency. Advisory programs are a great way that you can uh, work to accomplish this. Um, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, you know, I work at BlackBerry, and today BlackBerry is an enterprise software vendor selling uh, various security solutions, mobility solutions, um, as well as uh, uh, embedded components for folks building, you know, embedded devices. We've got real-time operating systems, libraries, SDKs, things like that. Um, and I lead the product security programs and operations team. Um, we've got a pretty wide set of responsibilities. I think most relevant to the uh, talk today and to the, um, the track here is that I have the open source programs within my team. So those are the folks that are building the open source bill of materials, the full software bill of materials, as well as uh, license compliance material. And then I also have the security uh, communications team. So that's a team of a program manager, uh, technical writer and uh, communication specialist, and they partner with our technical teams to uh, deliver on our security advisory programs. Um, and a special shout out to those folks because they helped me build this presentation. So just a little bit on goals today. Um, we've been doing security advisories, uh, vulnerability communications for a really long time. And um, you know we see a growing need here, so I really wanted to come and give our tips and tricks, share some of our templates, um, and some of our thought processes around how we do this. Um, in hopes that it'll help somebody else get started with their own program, or uh, maybe you have a, a program already and you're looking for you know different ideas or different ways to augment your program. Um, you know, I come I come at this from an enterprise software provider perspective, but uh, there's nothing here today that is um, specific to that industry, that vertical. Um, if you're working in you know nonprofits delivering software, or you're uh, maintaining and delivering open source libraries, pretty much everything today should be applicable to, uh, uh, to you. Um, so there's a couple of big industry forces we see really pushing um, on, on the needs for these programs. You know, one of them is that every year, uh, you know, we run statistics, we run uh, metrics on our own, um, our own inquiries, our own data around, you know, requests for um, the impact of vulnerabilities as it relates to our software. And there's just more and more customers every single year um, it keeps going up, 60, 70, 80% increases, just incredible demand on both the number of customers asking, the number of vulnerabilities they're interested in. Um, and then we also see a, a really big increase in the, the depth. So not only do we have the scope and the breadth, but the depth of what they're asking for. Um, I think that represents uh, you know, a lot of investment into um, vendor management programs within uh, you know, big enterprises. They're investing a lot into trying to manage that upstream risk, and that's where we end up seeing those, uh, those requests for this data. So the other big uh, force, and it's probably not a surprise to anyone you know, participating in this track today, a lot of focus on the supply chain, the complexity of supply chain, the importance of the supply chain, um, and just how um, diverse and complex the software supply chain is. You know, we're using so much more open source, so many more third-party components to ultimately deliver, you know, an end product to consumers. Um, coupled with that, you know, we see a lot of things like, um, for example, the executive order in the U.S. on cybersecurity, um, you know, requiring software bill of materials. That's another, you know, aspect of transparency. A lot of, a lot of what we talk about today is a really good companion um, to something like a software bill of materials. <clears throat> uh, think about customers a little more. Um, you know, we service a lot of different customer types, uh, all the way from really small, medium-sized business, all the way to great big enterprise, you know, 10, 20,000 person deployments, um, big government. Um, this is a little bit of a generalized table, um, but you know, this is what we see. It, it may or may not apply to you exactly, but generally, uh, you know, a lot of those smaller and medium-sized customers, they really don't have a, you know, a giant security team who can go and be proactive about every single vulnerability to interpret how it impacts each and every piece of software that they consume. Uh, there's much more of a reliance on uh, you know, software vendors to deliver them clear, concise, and actionable information that they can use to protect themselves. Um, 
not to say that the big enterprise customers don't need that as well, but there's, there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, you know, those big customers, those big enterprises definitely have a, you know, a richer security team probably being a little more proactive because they have the resources to be and doing a lot more uh, of their own investigation, their own interpretation as to how, how things apply um, in terms of a risk profile for themselves. The other thing to think about is that the big customers uh, often have longer test cycles. You know, you imagine if you have 10,000 users on a server, you take a bad software update, knocking 10,000 people offline is, is not fantastic. So we see a lot more of a richer test cycle with these customers, three, four, five, six months. Um, you know, that's a long time frame. And if you're shipping, um, you know, if you're being transparent, you're shipping vulnerability communications, you know, you're going to drive churn into their business. You're going you're gonna to cost them money. Um, and that is of a benefit. We want to be transparent with them. Um, however, you know, there's much more of an interest there for, you know, things like mitigations and workarounds, temporary measures that they can um, take uh, instead of interrupting their current test cycles. Um, kind of peeling that back one layer further on the customer front, <clears throat> you know, we see a lot of different questions from a lot of different customers. And one of the analogies that we use is, you know, what, what hat are they wearing? What, what is the perspective that they're coming at this from? Um, what is their background? What is their, what's that persona? And, you know, high level again, these are the three buckets we see. We see vendor management, security compliance, which might be the same bucket if, depending on which, uh, uh, you know, organization you're a part of. Or engineering, you know, you're seeing architects, analysts, things like that, um, asking uh, questions around vulnerabilities. On the vendor, ma vendor management side of things, you know, you're definitely seeing kind of higher level questions, kind of clear yes, no's. Um, as you start to veer into security compliance, you're getting more, you know, what's the CVSS score? How does it adhere to your policy? What was your response like? Things like that. And then as you get into the questions from more of the engineering side, you're getting those really in-depth questions, a lot of questions around mitigations, workarounds, and, um, you know, more context around how the issue could be exploited, the vulnerability could be exploited, so they can interpret that for themselves and how that might apply to their own network. <clears throat> um, so we've kind of touched on a couple of points already, but you know, why do we do advisories? What is the importance here? Um, I think the, the most important thing is that we're trying to arm our customers with enough data uh, around the risk so that they can make uh, informed and risk-based decisions um, as it applies to them and their organization. I think one of the things that often gets forgot about is that that's a great service to your customers. Um, however, it's also a great service to yourself as a software vendor, a software deliverer. Um, if you're aware of an issue, and this applies whether it's a vulnerability or, or something else, but if you're aware of an issue and you don't tell anybody about it, you don't do anything about it, you know, you're holding onto that risk and your li that liability, and you're effectively making a decision on your customer's behalf, um, and ultimately you may be held accountable for that. By communicating to your customer, by being transparent about vulnerabilities in your software, um, not only are you arming them with you know, actionable intelligence to take uh, you know, whatever measures they need to protect themselves. You're also reducing your own risk, your own liability, and you are performing risk transference. So this is a you know, fantastic win-win situation. Um, so I'm going to get into a couple of pillars. If you're starting a new program from scratch, you know, there's a couple of things you need to be building towards and thinking about. Uh, I think one of the things to keep in mind as you're building a program, you know, <clears throat> Generally, these programs are executed by the security team. That may look different depending on your organization. Um, but, you know, let's assume we're the security team here. You know, we're there as, uh, you know, custodians and representatives of our software team and their products. Um, ultimately, it is their products, but, you know, we're there to, you know, shield them from a lot of this noise, to provide them a service, um, and to take care of these challenges and issues for them. Uh, you know, we do need action out of them. We need, we need patches. We need software delivery. Um, but besides that, we really want to keep all of this noise away from them, let them get back to developing software, building features, delivering value. Uh, the other, you know, key team that we're there to enable is our customer service. And that may look really different depending on who your organization is, how you're formed. It could be a dedicated customer service org, sales engineering, technical account management. You know, there's a million flavors. But we're there to enable them to make sure that they have what they need in order to successfully manage customers, to meet their expectations, and to make sure they're happy and safe. So, 
you know, as you're, as you're starting to build your program, you're starting to form it up, you're starting to gather support, um, a couple of the key teams, uh, you know, we'd encourage you to talk to and think, and, and think about um, legal and, and corporate communications and corp, corp comms might be called, you know, public relations or something similar, but legal is, uh, I think legal is really interesting. I, I think they're probably the best partners out there because at a, at a high level, uh, legal and security have 100% shared goals, right? Reduce risk, reduce liability. We execute upon that differently. We have different ways of implementing that, but at a high level, you know, we're, we're definitely aligned. I think that, um, you know, if you're working with lawyers who have been in the software industry a long time, they'll, they'll get this no problem. Um, I think the privacy lawyers, lawyers are especially interesting. I think there's a lot of shared goals here as well with things like privacy policies and, you know, uh, enabling GDPR, building that transparency, building that trust through transparency. Uh, those folks are, are, I think, you know, really easy to get on the same page with those guys. Um, you know, if you're having trouble eliciting support to, you know, go and disclose vulnerabilities publicly about your uh, software, I think you can use a lot of that terminology we just talked about, you know, put it in those legal terms, reduce risk, reduce liability, um, risk transference. These are all things that should really resonate with this team. Corporate communications is interesting. You know, their, their role is generally to control the messaging about your organization external to your organization. And, you know, we're there as well with things like advisory programs where we'll be publicly, you know, discussing vulnerabilities in software. These folks have a lot of value to add in helping you, you know, learn how to shape messaging. I think there's some challenges. Uh, generally, if you asked every different team in your organization, you know, who would like to contribute to, you know, editing and reviewing communication, uh, they're all going to say they want to, they want a piece of the action and you're never going to ship anything. So we really want to control who actually gets to participate, but um, we do have some strategies for how you can gather feedback and in incorporate that feedback, but at the same time be able to run agilely. So we'll, we'll look at that in just a couple of slides. You know, another pillar you really need um, as part of building a new program, you're going to want a coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy. Generally, this is a document that's publicly posted, whether it's on your website or you know, wherever you're hosting your software, wherever is appropriate for, uh, for your organization. Um, you know, this is a public document that describes your commitment to be willing to receive vulnerability uh, reports from third parties uh, in good faith and to work with them to fix the issues, really software fixes, and to enable them if they wish to disclose that issue publicly. Um, it's a document that essentially says, Hey, I'm a mature software vendor, um, and I'm here to partner with you. So great for enabling relationships with third-party researchers who are looking at your product uh, or software, um, and really great for your customers. It's a really good show of uh, you know maturity that you have as a software vendor. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of different types of uh, vulnerability communications advisories that we would do. Um, these are, again, uh, high-level generalized. You can slice and dice these different ways. They might have different names of different companies, but you know, this is approximately what you'll see in industry. Um, we have coordinated disclosure advisories. No, we just talked about the policy. So this is a situation where somebody outside of your company has found a vulnerability in your software and They've reported it to you, and there's some expectation that they're, they're going to publicly disclose that issue. Um, they might do it through uh, you know, issuing a blog post, writing a white paper. They might come give a conference presentation about it. Um, but you know, they're, they're looking to go public and to talk about their research. And you know, we're going to enable them, um, but we want to coordinate with them. So I think one of the worst things you could possibly do uh, is to not have a companion document publicly posted alongside someone else who is publicly posting about your uh, vulnerabilities in your software. Um, if you're you know, not issuing a coordinated disclosure advisory, you, know, you can very quickly lose control of the messaging uh, around a vulnerability in your software. And you know, once you lose control, it's, it's pretty hard to get it back. Um, and if you don't take control of it, somebody else, uh, somebody else will. So we publicly post these, we acknowledge the issue, um, you know, we provide data on how customers can protect themselves, how they can fix the issue, and then we also thank the person that we've been working with to, uh, to go through this process. Um, and we'll, we'll look at uh, uh, a template of this in a minute. Um, we also have our security maintenance advisories, and you could think of these like security patch notes, security release notes, 
And these are a little bit more simplified, and I would think of them more as a, as a mass disclosure. We're going to do many issues. So you imagine as part of your software development lifecycle, you know, you're going to you're going to update your open source. You're going to take, you know, maybe you have a big release coming out for your software, and you update a whole bunch of libraries, and you pick up, you know, 50 vulnerability fixes, 50 CV fixes. It doesn't add a ton of value to do a big, long, you know, descriptive advisory on each and every one of those, um, but it does provide value for you to communicate to your customers that, hey, look, we're, we're fixing all these things. If you take the software update, it's going to mitigate risk. Um, we talked a few slides ago, you know, the, especially large customers may have really long test cycles. Um, you know, if you're shipping a software update and all your software update says is, hey, we've got these new features, and your customers say, well, I don't need those new features. I'm happy where I'm at. I'm going to ignore this because it would be expensive for me to take this and test it. Meanwhile, there's 50 vulnerability fixes, and if they knew about them, they'd probably be pretty excited to take this update. Um, or at the very minimum, they're at least informed and they can make a smart risk-based decision. Uh, the third bucket, the final bucket, uh, incident advisories. These are just in time. These are, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna back up a minute there. So the first two categories, you know, generally we're targeting these for the second Tuesday of the month, Patch Tuesday. You really wanna hit that Patch Tuesday date. This is when IT teams are, are staffed and ready to uh, not only monitor for advisories, they know they're coming, um, they're also staffed to, you know, do their patching cycles. If you hit them, you know, if you hit them at 4 p.m. on a Friday with an advisory, it's less than ideal. Um, you know, that's going to take overtime, weekend time, uh, generally not something customers are excited about. That being said, we have incident advisories, which generally don't go on a patch Tuesday and may come out at 4 p.m. on a Friday. So you really need to balance that. You know, there is a benefit of hitting those patch Tuesdays as much as possible at the same time. If you have critical information, you don't want to wait weeks on end to deliver that information to help uh, help your customers protect themselves. Um, these are there's a lot of kind of custom work that goes into these advisories. They're they're on short notice. The situations are very fluid. You may uh, know that you're affected by something. You may know you're not affected by something. You may have no idea at that point in time. Um, we're going to look at a template of this in a second. But speaking of templates. Um, you know, templates is the tool that we use, one of the ways that we can gather, uh, gather our partner team's feedback in advance of actually having to use one of these. So you imagine you're in one of those incident advisories, you're just in time. You don't have time to ask 10 different people how they feel about something. I mean, you've got to, you've got to go. Um, there is a lot of value in gathering that feedback in advance and templating as much language as you can. Um, you can template things like, you know, what are your standard fields? What are the standard data that you're going to collect and distribute, depending on the type? Um, how do you reference your organization? How do you, you know, what are the names of your products? What are the actual names? Not your internal names, not your nicknames, not your shorthand, your abbreviations. What is the actual customer facing name? Um, you can use templates to do things like uh, help enforce your business rules, where follow up questions go, um, how can I use this information, um, who's accountable for this, that, or the other. You can do really incredible things by, uh, by driving feedback into these templates. And then it allows you to move quickly as you need to actually use them. Okay, so um, I've got a, key, a few key data fields here on the screen. There's a lot more than this. We had tried to simplify it for the, the sake of the slide here. You're not going to use all of these pieces of data in each and every type of advisor you do. Generally, you're going to cite a CVE, um, regardless of type, and you're going to want to cite the, the score, so the CVSS score, the criticality, is it critical, severe, or, or maybe not so much. Um, if you're working on one of those coordinated advisories, you're, you're going to want to cite the person that you've been working with that found it, assuming they're, they're okay with that. Um, but if you're doing something like those, those maintenance advisories where you're mass disclosing, I mean, it, it doesn't really provide value to go and figure out who, who somebody else worked with. You know, that should have been covered in the upstream advisory. You know, really, really critically, impacted software, fixed software. Which software is impacted, which software is not impacted, which software fixes the impacted software. Okay, um, so we've got a couple of examples of our, our templates that we use. Um, I had to simplify this to try and make it readable on screen. Um, I do have an appendix in the uh, slide deck that's posted to Sketch, so if you want to see um, you know, a longer template here and a bunch of different examples that we're not going to cover today, they're all there uh, for reference if anyone needs them. Um, but again, you're seeing some of the common data here that we talked about, right? CV, 
uh, CVSS, you know, affected or, or impacted and, and not impacted, and various other data. So there's a bit of an eye chart here, a lot of color. Um, we use, uh, we've trained ourselves to use gray to um, help uh, highlight the data that doesn't change, right? So all of our fields on the left don't change. Some of the various data throughout the template does not change. This helps us really focus on the data that does change and is unique to the situation. Um, and that's what we see in yellow. So yellow is stuff that we have to customize per, per advisory, per situation. And then we've got a little bit of red in here just for emphasis on really key data. But this is something that we'd post to the website. You know, we, we go through one of those coordinated disclosure situations with a third party, work with them, and we would post this alongside, um, you know, what, whatever the documentation is that they would be issuing. Uh, we got a little bit different of a flavor of a template here. So, um, you know, the last template was something we would issue to, uh, to our website. This is something that's a little more hands-on. Um, we have a lot, you know, we've, we've got a pretty um, complex customer support um, unit, um, and we have a lot of uh, actively managed accounts. So a lot of uh, a lot of customers who really like that white glove approach, that that, that reach out, that open dialogue. Um, you know, there's ways that you can subscribe to information, but a lot of those customers do prefer the the hands-on touch. So one of the things that we do um, is we issue documentation internally to all of our customer-facing teams, and you know let them deliver it what, however it aligns with their processes. You know some customer-facing teams will um, use other tooling to mass deploy this. Some of them will actually reach out you know manually through email to their customers and build that relationship. Some of them call their customers. It's just a bunch of different ways the information gets used, and um, you know providing it in this format is is helpful to our uh, our support teams. Um, but we'll walk through this a little bit. Um, so this is something we would use on, uh, you know, one of those instant bases. It's, it's 4 p.m. on a Friday. Somebody announces a new CV in, you know, a library that we're all using. It's, it's, it's just starting to blow up in the industry. Everyone's talking about it. Customers are starting to ask. And, you know, we would instantiate this template in a couple of different ways. Um, we might say, listen, like, we're aware of the issue, but we don't quite know yet if we're impacted. But hold on, we're going to figure it out. We'll get back to you. We may know definitively that we're not impacted, and we can make that definitive statement right away. Hey, we're not impacted. It's all good. Don't worry. When you're impacted and you know you're impacted, that's where you're getting into a lot more of kind of custom language crafting. It's where we spend a lot of time really finesse, finessing the communications. Um, but let's walk through this example a little bit, this uh, template a little bit. Uh, and you'll see right at the top here, we'll have a marker for uh, where a verbal and written statement begins. And then in the middle of the page, we're going to see verbal and written statement ends. This is a cut and pasteable chunk of text that those teams can use. However they use them in their own processes, we leave that to them. We just make the information available. But let's walk through it a little bit. So uh, company is aware that on you know, this date, uh, details were released about a CV. Generally, you're going to have a CV number. You might have a name at the time. You know, may maybe it's just a URL, but some something to reference, some, some primary key there. Um, and then, you know, who's reporting it? Is it being widely reported in industry? Is it a specific blog post? You know, whatever context you can give there is helpful. And then we move on to the, you know, the meat and potatoes. You know, what's the actual issue? And it's so dynamic, uh, depending on what, what the vulnerability is, what's going on, you know, are, is it being exploited? Is it not being exploited? This is where you spend a lot of your time filling, filling in these templates. Um, it is really important uh, to let your customers know. You know, if if you know they're under attack, you know you should you should let them know. You know, there's a heightened risk. Um, otherwise, it, it is very reassuring to let them know. You know, you're not aware. You're not aware of any attacks that are targeting your customers. So, past the uh, the verbal and written statement ending marker, you'll see we've have uh, frequently asked questions. Um, generally, what we do is we take our written statements. You know, we write up a nice chunk of text. It's, you know, tons of context, lots of depth, you know, a really useful uh, piece of communication for a customer. And then we take that and we slice and we dice it. And we trim it down to really clear, crisp, yes, no. Is the software affected? Yes, no. If yes, you know, what fixes it? How do you mitigate it? And you have all those different customer types, you know, all those different ways that customers are serviced. Even though it's effectively the same information, uh, you know, a lot of different people digest information in different ways, and we find this just really helps enable 
you know, that kind of gamut of different customers and also the different relationships and different ways that customers are managed, whether that's, you know, through automated tools, through verbal conversation, through written email, or whatever it might be. Um, this is a list of different documents that we, um, we use. I'm not going to go through the table. Um, I just wanted to have it here as a reference. We do have these templates in the appendix for folks to pull if, uh, if they're of interest. Okay, so a couple of tips and tricks as you're, you know, you know, standing up your program, you're starting to write communications like this. Um, you know, a lot, of, you know, I mentioned before, everybody's using a lot of upstream software, right? That's just a key component of, of modern software delivery. Um, I, I want to encourage everyone to not feel the need to be the expert in somebody else's software if the vulnerability that you need to communicate about is, you know, in an upstream library, upstream component, and, um, you know, that vendor, that provider of the software has, you know, rich documentation available. Don't be afraid to link to it. Um, you know, you, you should be the expert of how it impacts your software, but you don't need to be the ultimate expert of the vulnerability in somebody else's library. Um, so, you know, link to that information if it's available. Um, similarly, you know, make sure you identify all of the supported software and the impact of that software. You know, ideally you're gonna have either an end of life policy that's posted or, um, you know, a software support page that lists what, what of your software is and is not in support. So if version one, two, and three are all in support, you should be accounting for is V1 impacted, is V2 impacted, is V3 impacted? And if so, what software fixes it? Uh, consistent naming. So we talked before the templating. Um, you know, as you, as you define, you know, those proper names, the proper references for your software, your company, et cetera, make sure you're being consistent. Um, you know, it's really important that you're using consistent naming advisory to advisory. Your customers will want to take that data and correlate it um, and, and run that through their vulnerability management system. So do them a favor, be consistent. And we talked about, you know, providing attribution. You're working with a third party directly. Cite them if, if they're okay with that. Um, a couple of things you want to avoid. Um, don't make a definitive statement if you are not definitively sure um, about that statement. Um, there's nothing wrong with not knowing, uh, especially with some of these, you know, these just-in-time uh, vulnerability communications. It's okay to not know. Um, it's okay to say, listen, we know about it, we're investigating, and, and we'll get back to you. And I think that actually provides a ton of value to customers. So if you think of those large enterprises, right, they could have a thousand, maybe maybe two thousand software vendors who are providing even more software than that to them. And when you know something like you know, like Log for Shell, something like that drops, they're going to run around to each and every one of their vendors. Hey, are, are you impacted? And they may or may not get a response by proactively telling them that you're aware and that you're investigating, and you will get back to them. They can triage you right to the bottom of their list. They can go move on. They can go and chase down the vendors who haven't communicated, who may not know of the issue. They can go and start working to mitigate the uh, software where the vendors have indicated they are impacted. Um, so even if you might feel like, hey, saying I'm aware, but I don't know, um, that, is a, that is a big benefit, a big value to customers. <laughs> that was a really hard one. I, I think I swear we did 12, 13 revisions of our documentation on that because, yeah, it's, hey, we fixed. Oops, that, that wasn't the right fix. Sorry, you know. Um, you only know what you know at the time, and so long as you're keeping up, right, and you're continuing to keep the information flowing, I mean, that was such a fluid a fluid situation, right? I think we were writing and writing and writing and investigating and investigating for, for weeks, right? And it was, it was the first fix that didn't take. It was the second fix. It was all of the peripheral vulnerabilities that were different things, but the same library, but customers were so riled up over, over that component. Um, that felt like the never ending. I lost a few vacation days over that one. I think, uh, I think many of us did. So yeah, I mean, that's tough, but right, you, you know, I said before, don't make definitive statements unless you're definitively sure. Honest mistakes happen, right? So there will be times where you make a mistake or 
you didn't even make a mistake. It's just that is the situation. The industry thought that was the right fix. Everyone took that fix. 48 hours later, crap, right? So you can only do as much as you can. But be transparent, right? Keep going, keep updating, keep delivering uh, on the mitigations. OK, um, so you know the templates we looked at before, you, know, you can use those manually. You can automate those into your vulnerability management system, script them, you can do all kinds of things. Um, there's some really cool uh, frameworks popping up. Probably a lot of people you know, in this track are aware of things like Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange, really cool companion to something like uh, you know, Software Bill of Materials. Um, this essentially lets you implement the security maintenance uh, advisories into a machine-readable format, and it gives you options to do things like um, you know, uh, impacted by a CV, and here's the fix version, uh, impacted but not fixed, or you know, not impacted, and, and here's a variety of reasons why. It's pretty cool. Um, there's a bunch of different frameworks that are implementing VEX documents, like uh, the Common Security Advisory Framework. I know there, there's other, uh, other frameworks out there. I'm pretty excited about the CSAF. Uh, not only can you implement VEX in it, it also has a, other, um, I think there are four or five other types of documents that you can capture within a, within a VEX, or sorry, within a CSAF uh, uh, framework. And effectively, CSAF will let you implement everything we looked at today and more. Um, starting to wrap up here. Um, I, I really do believe in the advisory programs. We've done them for a long time. I love working um, uh, within the program. And I think that as we start to see more, more of that pressure on the, um, on the very complex software supply chain, as we have more people um, building advisory programs upstream, you know, that really puts pressure um, down the supply chain. And it's going to help everyone uh, be able to resource and to put more uh, emphasis on patching. And for everyone that's uh, disclosing upstream, that's you know another person downstream who then needs to patch and disclose so the next person downstream can patch and disclose. Um, and ultimately, we're going to push each other to be you know, in a better security posture and just to be more secure as an industry. So I think that's fantastic. Um, I would also really like if more people who ran these kind of programs came and you know, gave presentations about what they're doing. There's not a lot of content uh, of this type in the industry. And I would, I, if anyone else is doing something like this, I would love to learn from you. Um, but that's it for me. Um, I think there's just a huge demand for this kind of data. Um, I think everyone's going to need a program like this as, uh, as the industry moves on. Um, and I really do think that programs like this are, are a win-win, both for, uh, you know, say, someone like myself as a software provider and the customers who receive them. It's just a fantastic program to have. So that's it for me. Um, I'll take any other questions if they're, yeah, go ahead. That's an interesting question. Um, Okay, so the question was, uh, you know, C CVs are a lagging indicator. So, um, you know, a vulnerability may appear before it's assigned a CV, and how can you start, you know, acting on that beforehand? I think we do that pretty often. I think you, you don't necessarily need a CV to start communicating about it, but it provides a lot of value, right? Because it's, it gets very confusing if you have customers coming through your door saying, I got to know about that cross-site scripting issue. Like, which one, right? It, it just gets muddy really quickly. Um, but sometimes you don't have it, right? Sometimes you have a link to a blog post or, you know, some other some other IOC. I think may maybe the solution there is that we have a you know an easier way to assign CVs. So one of the cool things that Mitre is doing is they're really pushing for, um, you know, a lot of things were form based before. You know, you go and manually request a block of CV. So this uh, probably shouldn't get into the details of CNA program, but you know, you can become a CNA, which is a uh, a signer of CVEs for a certain scope. So, so for us, my team handles the MITRE management, and we have a scope of, of BlackBerry, and we assign the CVEs for BlackBerry, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Microsoft does that, Adobe, et cetera. Um, and a lot of that is just through, has been through forms. You go to a manual form. You say, hey, give me, give me 50 CVEs for the year. When you need to assign one, you go back to a different form. You say, hey, can you upload this data? Manual, manual, manual. 
Um, they are really moving towards their API. There are some really cool open source tools uh, called uh, Volnagram, puts a nice front end on that, um, which is making CV assignment much less painful, much quicker. So one of my challenges with advisory when we're doing it manually is that we want to publish our advisory on a certain date at a certain time. You might have to wait two weeks for that to actually get published and propagated to like the NIST uh, NVD. So that's really going to help, right? We're going to cut down a lot of that early lag time. Um, I think there's probably other opportunities as well to make it more uh, easier for folks who are not a CNA to assign, right? Because there's a lot of setup there to get yourself to the position of being able to assign a CV. And if you're just doing it for the first time or you don't know what to do, or ah, it can be really scary. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for education. There's a lot of opportunity for education on what should get a CV and what does not require a CV. I don't think there's canonical use cases for that at this point. So. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah we have, so we have a dedicated team for that. We have our PCERT team, Product Security and Incident Response, and they perform uh, really detail-oriented work to uh, figure out that impact, right? So we have kind of two streams. We have, let's be proactive about it, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of volume, and um, you know, sometimes customer questions beat you to the punch, right? And so sometimes you'll trigger an investigation off a customer question, um, but you go in to figure it out, right? You go in to figure out, um, do you actually... And so the scanners are tricky, right? Because they say, listen, you're, you're using OpenSSL. We, we, we see it. But the real answer might be, yeah, but we use like three files. We trimmed it down. We took out that subcomponent where we configured something off by default. Or there's all kinds of things or other mitigations in your product. Oh, this is a critical issue. Well, no, it's not because we did X, Y, and Z to our product. Um, so we have a dedicated function, dedicated process, tools. Kind of got the full suite there. Um, so that... That is a way. It is tough because there are customers out there who say, well, I don't care. I, I need it to go away. You know, I'm vendor management. And so long as there's a, you know, a red X on that report from the scanner, I'm upset with you and we need to remediate that. That's a tough one. That's, that gets to more of like a business requirement negotiation, right? The security team can give their input and say, listen, it's not a critical. It's a, it's a low. And here's the justification. Um, and at that point, I would, I would hand it off to the business because that's a, that's a business decision, not a, not a risk-based decision at that point. Any other questions? Um, so, I mean, kind of outside the scope of advisory, but um, so as an example, uh, another one of the programs we run is called Pen Testing Coordination Office. We've got a lot in terms of customer requirements for uh, external validation. So you, you could have fully staffed, um, you know, proactive, you know, research, SAS, DAS testing, uh, composition analysis. You could do all the things, check all the boxes, and you still get a lot of customers coming and saying, well, yeah, that's good, but... I want, I want an auditor to come in and poke at your products, right? So again, that's more, that's more business than um, you know, technical security risk. Um, but it is a big problem, right? And uh, you know, there's standards, there's regulations pushing for, for more of that kind of independent audit. Um, but ultimately, I look at that as more of a business requirement and challenge. But yeah, like a lot of times you're gonna need to do that. Um, probably depends on your customer base and depends on the type of products you sell. I definitely see more of a demand there in terms of security software than, than other types of software. Or cloud-based software as well, right, where you're, you're hosting data for the customer. A lot of concern over that. They want, they want more assurance. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>